Uh, good morning everybody out there in YouTube land. Um, welcome me a little bit. This is my first video ever. Um, like a lot of you, I have bought one of these Nikon 17-35 to lenses. And I got a really good deal on it at the time I bought it. Uh, it, it the zoom was working as you can see now. It is locked up hard. And it's also got a little bit of dirt inside of it. So I figure I watched a couple other videos on YouTube and now I'm an expert. So I'm going to tackle this thing. I don't have so much money tied up in it that I'm not scared to take it apart and see what happens. And I can always ship it off to somebody in a box and let them figure out my problem. Um, I got a few tools together. I got had to run out by this little screwdriver set because all my stuff's in a storage unit and I didn't feel like digging in there to get it. Um, I do know you need to go all the way down to P triple alt. I don't think I'll be able to get that to focus, but it does say on there P triple alt. There you go. That's the smallest one you're going to need through this. Uh, some tweezers to get stuff out, pick up a little screws with. Smallest pair of needle nose I got, so I grabbed them. And, you know, this is Hillbilly Camera Repair, and I'm from West Virginia, so I got a knife. Because you always need a knife anytime you're doing anything. Um, one thing I always recommend is organization. All of y'all have a bunch of these things around. Get a couple of them out, line them up, put your screws in them. As you take something like this apart, stay organized left to right put the pieces down left to right put the screws with them so that as you go to put it back together you know i've got to go right back to left i haven't done this before i've done things like this i can tell you that will save your life um first thing i want to ask is you know can anybody tell me in the comments why there's a pac-man logo on my nikon lens cap uh, anyway back to task so we're going to take this off oh and look another container for more screws so we're going to start off there i'm going to get this hood out of the way um, this is the Nikon 17 to 35 f 2.8 D model. Uh, this thing is notorious for an AFS squeak and for a locked zoom. Um, this one was a squeaky model. It is the newer model. Uh, this has a, a serial number that starts with a four. Uh, anything that starts with a four is the newer version of this older lens. Um, the twos and threes are the older models, if that helps you any. Um, so I'm going to get started. And like I said, I've watched a few videos about this, so I'm going to stumble through it. I may have to stop this video because I anticipate this taking me a few days. Um, but there, on either side of the contacts, there are two screws on the side of the ring that are much smaller than the other screws on the side of the ring. So these all five of these screws around the side of this ring are the first things you've got to take out. So we're going to just delve right in here. And because we have two different size screws in this same location, there you go. Going right in the cup. But since they all go in the side of the ring, and even though they're different sizes, I can put them all in the same container. One thing I'll... I've also learned through the years that will save you is every screw you take out of something like this, check the length because if one of the screws is longer or shorter than the others, it has to go back in the same hole. And if you don't index it or mark that hole, you're going to really be sweating it later when you're trying to put the wrong length screw into your lens or whatever it is you're taking apart. Um, I did look this lens up on Amazon. Uh, as of the date of this filming, this lens was $1,951. Um, I really lucked out. I got this off of eBay for $360, um, including the shipping. And like I said, it was fully functional when I got it, and over a couple of weeks it, it locked up, which I knew I was taking that risk when I bought this lens. Um, I've run out of things to talk about here, so you'll have to excuse me if I don't talk a lot while I do this. I did look up quite a few chat boards before I did this and most of the folks who did send their lens in to KEH or Central or someone like that 
they said that now here's uh, I'll get back to that they said the repair this repair cost them about three hundred dollars and that included a service of the lens so I'm not going to get too far into this and I may back out put it back together and ship it off myself it's all it's a very viable option um, now before I get too far into this the other thing I was going to say is one thing I found is very important with all of these things is indexing and if you don't know what indexing is you want to pick a mark and obviously that's going to be a good mark to pick and every time you take a piece off as you take it off place it down point the index mark towards you pull the piece off and translate it if you don't know what translate means that means move it without spinning it translate it over and set it back down so that you know when you go to put this back together I have to pick this piece up I have to index the lens and have to translate this right back into position so you're not going to be sitting here going oh crap which way which way was this so remember index and translate every piece you take off of something like this that translates over to you know working on cars and other things too now I know that from the other videos I watched this piece can't come out yet um, until you've taken the bezel off of the mounting ring I'm not don't know the names of these parts I'm gonna make it up as I go we're gonna get into words like whammy wheel and who daddy here before long And I am, uh, just another thing to note, I am not a nervous talker, so when I stop talking, it's because I don't have anything to say. And I don't just keep talking like I've done other folks to do. I'll switch over to a little bit larger bit. These screws are quite a bit larger than the first set we took out. And there's the first one. That's a pretty long one. I'm going to go into the second bin over here, and I'm going to go clockwise. I probably should have started at 6 o'clock, but from what I've watched, I know that one of these screws is significantly shorter than the others. So, so far, these two are the same, and along with the indexing, another thing you can do, you can index your screws as you take them out. You can line them up here in a circle pointed towards the center in the same positions you took them out of the lens. And like I said, I am no lens repair expert. I've never done this before, but I've learned, I've made enough mistakes through the years to learn from it. And this screw, the one at 12 o'clock, is the shorter screw. You can see there it's significantly shorter than the other two I've taken out. And now we've got longer screw at 2 o'clock so you can index it there at 2 o'clock all the way down here to 6 6 o'clock is a longer screw so with your index mark at 6 o'clock the short screw is at 12 o'clock we should be able to pull this out and again we're going to index it so we're going to I'm going to scoot some of these out. I know you can't see these anymore, but I need to make a little bit more room for myself as I go here. I'm going to scoot these over and keep them indexed. So this piece, I'm going to pull it out and I'm going to translate it up here and I'm going to set it right on top of the screws that I pulled out of it. So this whole this whole top assembly now is loose. This has the aperture control. I'm being very gentle here. I don't know if anything's attached. Okay, so there's nothing attached to this piece. When you pull it out, there's a, a bar here that slides down into something down in there that I can't quite see yet. There's something down in there that indexed into, so I'm going to have to make sure I figure that out later. But that is the as the other end of the aperture control. So again, I'm going to pull this out and I'm going to lay it up here in order, keeping it indexed, you know, left to right. And then this piece, these brass shims, which there's three of them on here, 
I'm going to put them back in so I can pick this up and show you a little closer view of this. All right, so there's there's a screw right here, and the brass shims have a slot from the inside that fits over this this boss. And the other videos I watched, I don't remember seeing three of these, so I got, I have imagine these are of different thickness to shim some pieces into place to where they'll function correctly. And there's also a there's also a slot here that lined up with this which I'm just noticing these things so that I can keep track of them as I go. So I'm going to translate this right back up to here. Again, working left to right. And as you work left to right and you lay more pieces out, you can keep scooting these down so that as you pull your screws out, you put them in the bin that correspond to the piece that goes with it. Okay. Now at this point, I believe this I believe this piece is the next piece that has to come out. One thing I want to try right now, yeah, it's still locked. And given that this piece is attached to the zoom ring, that's the next piece I'm going to take a shot at here. And I do recall the one video I saw on YouTube. The gentleman had a very difficult time getting this piece out. One thing that concerns me here is, is dropping one of these screws down inside this lens somewhere. I can't shake it back out, and then I'll be forced to pull it completely apart. So we got a very tiny screw here. And the second very, I'm assuming a very short screw. Now one thing at this point I'd, I'd recommend is that every piece you remove from the lens you want to take a shot at spinning the zoom because at some point you're going to get to the part that had the interference issues and you're going to want to know when that when you when you reach that point now this piece this is the brush contacts Oh, and see, as soon as I took those screws out, look here. So there's something between the zoom ring, which is what this piece screwed into, and whatever this piece is, it looks like it has some electrical contacts on the other, other end of it, but there's something that is holding this piece from turning because it spins very freely now. There's no resistance at all. So as we take this apart, we want to focus on this part, this piece, because it obviously either is or is connected to the issue that we're trying to correct here. Now I'm just noticing a little more of the operation here. Over here, there's two screws on this side right below the contacts. And as you can see, there's a boss on the inside of the zoom ring with a gap in it. And that's what stops. Those are your stops. And every time I set it down, make sure you set the lens back down with the index mark right toward you. Whatever you chose for your index mark. Oh, and I, you know what? I just remembered there may be another piece here that I have to remove. But I sure do think that this... And yes, before you, before someone throws it in the comments, I realize I do not have the correct type of tweezers to be doing this, but I'm just working with what I've got available to me. This piece, whatever this is, it is, it is fastened hard, and it, you know, even even just putting the screwdriver in the holes and trying to spin it left and right, it's not, it's not going to happen. So that. That's my prime suspect right there. Book him, Dano. I do remember from the, uh, the video that one of these pieces, it had something under the rubber ring. So I'm going to 
pop this off and it looks like there's a little bit of glue in a couple of places so I may have to get some contact cement just to help hold this back in place when I reassemble it yep and my memory failed me there there is nothing under that so that was a waste of time don't do that there's no need to there's nothing under it uh oh Alright, so there's another clue that this thing has some up and down play in it now. But not enough to help me get it apart. Alright, so at this point we're going to take a break while I do some research. Back at you in five. Alright, I'm back. I think I got this figured out. There's a gap in the, in the zoom ring here that you need to spin around to get this boss to the other side of this piece with the electronic brushes on it what I think are brushes but it won't go that far because of the boss screws over here the stop the hard stops we're going to take these hard stops out and then the zoom should spin around far enough to pull this vertically out so that's going to be our next step It may only take one. There's there's two screws in there. Boy, it's tight. So I'm gonna try the magnet this time. There you go. Got it right out. See the funny little ball screw. That's all that is is a hard stop. Drop that right in here. Now we're gonna see if that one screw gives enough distance to pull this piece out. It does not look like it's going to be enough because that piece has a tail on it that sticks vertically downward. So I'm going to take the other ball screw out. We'll get a little more travel that way. Now, coincidentally, one of these two screws was, was loose. It wasn't tight. I don't think that was part of the issue. All right, so now we've spun this around past it. And no dice. And so this piece has more room here now. Oh, and there it went straight down. So there we go. Now we're getting somewhere. So once you move that metal piece out of the way, the outer housing can start to move upwards. The one thing I do know. Be careful, don't just jerk this thing off of here, because look, oh, there's a switch in it. So you've got to unhook this. You don't have to actually unplug the wires. You just take the screws out of this. Which I have to change my bit for. P triple off. P zero 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 for you non-engineering types. Okay. Put this in the next bin. So this, you have to pull this to the outside and then put it back through the hole diagonally. Let's take a minute here just to look at which orientation it is compared to this. Now, unfortunately, one problem I run into now is, oh no, I lost my index mark. So I'm going to pick out something else to be my index mark down here. really 
really sure what that's going to be, so I may have to... not sure which of these pieces spin and move. Now I'm going to go with this piece. I'm going to see the index mark is right over here somewhere. Just do our, I'm just going to do my best to not spin this around every time I pick it up and turn it. Now hopefully this piece should come out now. It's quite a convoluted shaped item. There's the electrical contact I was talking about. And this bar. Which, interestingly enough, seems to have... I don't know if that's some kind of graphite lubricant that's been put on there, but it, it doesn't rub off. I'm not real sure what that is, but this, this piece is right inside of here. It doesn't... It does not look or appear to be damaged. I do find it odd though, these pieces look like electrical contacts, but if they are, it's only for a ground because they're not individual wires going to each of these tines. They all appear to be straight. The rod itself appears to be straight and square. So I'm going to set this aside. And we'll put it in, put it in here with the screws that went into it. And now, take a minute to take a gander at everything in here and figure out how this thing works. So when I get to a point where I have more information, I'm going to turn the camera back on. Alright, I'm back. I figured out a little bit more information here. I haven't found a solution yet, but this piece connects the zoom ring to a guide here that controls this screw that rides in a helical boss here so that when you turn the zoom ring it turns this which forces the piece this is connected to inside this housing to move in and out so I can tell from just trying to push on this screw it's still stuck so that remember we talked about this was our first suspect well, we've transferred that suspicion now to this screw. That screw does come out, but at this point I'm not ready to take that out. I'm afraid that, and, and in, also in consideration that I need to get inside this lens and find out whether, this lens has what I would call moderate contamination or dust in it. I didn't see any fungus or haze, but there's probably 30 flecks of dust in there that I want to get out. So to get further into where the actual elements are, I think I'm going to need to take all these electronics off and actually get in here and see the mechanics of this. So that's, that's a little bit worrisome, but one thing you want to do is just make sure you have some very good images of how everything goes back together. Take pictures, take video as you take anything like this apart. There's a lot of contacts in here. There's a lot of these brushes we talked about that ride on these, almost like a circuit board piece. I don't know how well this is coming across in the film, but you can see the brushes. The brushes just short out from one strip to the other, and the strips have gaps. So that by shorting from one to the other, it tells the computer at what position this is located. And you can see here the one I've already removed, the, the brushes I was, I was describing wrote on these strips in here that have gaps. And then by knowing which gaps are skipped or which strips are skipped, the computer knows what position it is. So that's how, so this little piece tells your camera at what zoom your, your variable zoom lens is positioned at the moment you take a photograph. So... At this point, I need to start removing all these electronics, which have this, this red goop over top of the screws. I'm not worried about a warranty, so I can only imagine that that's just there to tell them if someone's tampered with a lens that's under warranty. So at this point, that's what I'm going to start to remove is 
the electronics. There's there's several of these screws. There's another one down in here. Um, but we're looking at this point just for the screws that attach the electronic framework to the lens housing so we can get this out of the way, hopefully without destroying it. So, and the other thing that's going to happen here is I'm going to lose my index because right now I know my index is right about here. So I'm going to have to transfer and, and, and all this moves so you can't rely on this, but I know that somewhere in this point of the electronics is where my index is. So I have to find another index. And I actually have or had a marker laying around here. Which I'm going to go find. Alright, so not the best index mark maker. I use a black sharpie on black plastic, but it's not the kind of thing you just want to say, oh, I'll just figure it out later. So I'm going to put a mark on the housing right below this screw. So I'm going to say that this screw, I don't know how well you can see that right now, but I'm going to say that this, this screw right here that I'm getting ready to remove, see I put a black mark right under it, that's my new index. That's my new 6 o'clock. Alright, so... And to uh, quote the Joker, here we go. No, nope, that's too big still. I'm going to stick with the, the, the P triple alt. I've used the P triple alt for every screw on this lens so far, except the, the flat screws, the, the boss screws. I used the, uh, it's a 1 16th straight blade. So, again, here we need to make sure you've got a good spot. To keep indexing your the pieces as you remove them. Don't get in such a hurry to take these things apart that you just say, "Oh, it's I'll figure it out later." Because yeah, later could be next week, and you're not going to remember. Word of uh, experience there. You take something apart one Saturday and you put it back together the next Saturday, you're not going to remember. We'll move on to my next bin here with these screws, keep them all together. And as I take each one out, I'm going to make a note of the size and compare it to the last one. I'm also noticing here that this piece appears that it stays connected. Not sure actually I think the screw I just took out is connected to this piece which it looks like this is a connector and these pieces will actually come apart separately because there's a screw behind this ribbon cable there's another screw back here that that ties this down so I think I'm going to have to disconnect this I'm not entirely sure how that's supposed to happen I have dealt with these types of connectors before and they are they're delicate and I do not know it's not the kind of thing you just want to go putting your fingernail on and start prying away at and my my eyes have reached a point in my life where I can't necessarily just make this out. So give me a minute, back to some research, coming back at you. All right, we're back. The internet is your friend. There's very few problems you can't solve by doing a few Google searches. These ribbon connectors, this piece slides out of this. To release it, you have to push the clamp laterally if you push this clamp sideways very gently from these hooks on either side see that one pop out and that one pop out and once those are popped out 
the ribbon slides right out. So now we can get the connector to the camera body is loose and comes out as an assembly. We're going to set that aside here. Again, we're indexing everything. So now that I know how to disconnect these ribbon connectors, that's going to make the rest of this go pretty quick. So now I know if I just push this down. And yes, I know at some point someone in the comments is going to say, you're not grounded. Well, that's true, but if you just ground yourself a little bit and then sit down and go to work and it's not a real dry climate, you're probably going to be okay. Don't come squalling to me if you shock your lens and blow it up. Not my fault. If you think you need to ground yourself, ground yourself. Very gently here. This one pops out and then there's another screw behind it, which is what I was trying to access to begin with. Going back to the Phillips, I can get back to the task at hand here. <clears throat> I'm having pretty good luck right now with the magnet getting these screws out, so I'm just going to keep on doing that may not be the right thing to do. There might be something that's magnetically sensitive in here, but again, like I said, I don't have so much invested in this lens that I'm not scared to tackle this job myself. And so far, every one of these screws I've gotten three out, but as you can see, they're, I don't know if this is actually focusing on them or not, but they're, they are identical. <laughs> it would appear that like I said, always need a knife. It would appear that this red substance on here might be an adhesive, because even though I've removed the screw from this brace, it seems like it's stuck pretty good. So I'm gonna drag my knife down the edge of it just a little bit, try to break that bond. Don't wanna overstress anything inside this camera. And I've run my fingers over everything, so at some point I have to Remember, as we put this back together, I've got to clean everything as I go back. Now, there's some screws down in here that I can't yet access. They're, they're covered by this circuit board here, so I know at some point this, this item is going to have to start coming apart to where I can access the pieces behind it. And the next next screw I can see here is down in here behind a ribbon cable that I can't I can't access there's one between these two capacitors yep they're capacitors they may have a little bit of juice in them I'm trying to figure out where that ribbon cable goes I can't really see where the thing oh it zigzags up inside of there to something else so I'm going to skip that one for the moment and I'm going to take this screw out which I can already see appears to be a different screw than the screws I've removed so far which could pose a problem stuck in there pretty good. This may be the point where I have to stop and go find some pointed tweezers. Or I can realize that I don't need to take that screw out yet and I can just tighten it back up.
move on to the next one. That that screw to the left of the capacitors appears to be what holds this lower board in place, which appears to be attached to the housing and not to the electronics. So we're gonna hopefully this piece will scoot up a little bit after I get it all loose and then I can access the screws for this. That's what I'm accounting on. So we got another one up here, which would also explain why that screw seemed to not match. Now there's a wire that goes under this particular bracket, that white wire right there. It was right smack under there, and I can't help but wonder if that was intentional, and it's probably a ground. So we're going to have to make sure when we put this back, this particular screw back in, that wire is again under there if, if it's just a ground. It may go into a hole in the housing, I can't tell yet. So that each screw I take out, I'm, I'm testing the board to see if it's getting any looser. And so far it is not. You know, I know someone's going to say, you can't pry on a circuit board. Well, it's not actually a circuit board. This is a sheet of aluminum. And this entire circuit board is printed on a ribbon cable looking material that is just looks like it's scotch taped to the aluminum. So I'm not prying on a circuit board here. There we go. All right, so the adhesive gave way. And you can see that the circuit board is starting to come loose now. And I can see that I do need to get this screw out because there's another piece that goes up and attaches to this. So I'm going to have to attack this one again. Now that I have this one loose, I might be able to move it out of the way enough to get this screw out at this point. And if not, we'll try some West Virginia tricks. Like smacking it with a 2x4. All right, so the lower circuit board is loose now as well. It's all looks like it's all attached together. So my tweezers will now fit. But the screw is stuck. Looks like there's two distinctly separate pieces under that screw. I did finally get it out and checking it. It is a little bit larger than the other screws I've taken out. So in that case, very difficult to index at this point. I'm gonna to have to remember that the one screw that goes right here to the left of the capacitors is the larger screw. Now I've got this, this is completely loose, this whole end of the board. And then going back to this wire, that wire is a bare wire, it's stripped and I, I can only apologize if my camera isn't focusing enough, but you just have to take my word for it. If it's not, I don't have a cameraman here available. This, this white wire was purposefully placed between this bracket and the housing to provide a ground to the housing for the electronics. So when you put this screw in, you need to make darn sure that this bare white wire or this stripped white wire goes under that bracket. The big reason I'm not I'm not recording this just for you folks. I mean, you're getting the benefit of me possibly screwing up here, but I'm recording this so that when I go to put this lens back together, I'm going to watch this video about ten times first. And I'm probably going to do one piece at a time, watching the video between each time. Now, another thing I'm noticing is, here is that there are right here. There's a black, a blue, and a white wire. They come off a ribbon cable that goes down below this this piece, and I haven't exactly figured out what this is, but I'm pretty sure it's related to the focus mechanism. But there's a ribbon cable that goes down there. It comes up, black, blue, and white wires connected to it, and they come over here and, and connect to this. And I currently don't see a way to disconnect those wires. And I sure ain't going to cut them. So we gotta, we gotta keep that in mind as we go here, that we still have wires that are connected to the, the lens housing. So this is, this is slowly getting looser and looser here as I get more and more screws out. And 
as is the focus ring. Focus ring is starting to move upwards on me, so I have to be careful of that. Now I still have a screw down here behind the ribbon wire between the two capacitors down in there. So at some point I may have to dive in here and see if I can disconnect that ribbon wire. And all this, you can see, this is just all scotch taped together, so we can pull that off. And I suspect if I called Nikon, they'd tell me that's $35 scotch tape, but yeah, we're not going to do that. This ribbon wire comes over, and it looks like it folds back and comes down and connects to this circuit board. There's not a lot of slack in it, but the more I look at it, I think I can actually get my screwdriver above it. When I say above it, this would be above and this would be below. I can go above the ribbon tape, right in between the two capacitors, and I can access that screw. You know. I tell you, when I go to put this screw back in, it's going to be a daggone nightmare. But there's a trick to that too. You just get a little bit of some kind of putty, stick it in the slots of the screw, and then stick the screw on the end of your screwdriver. It'll hold it in place long enough for you to get it started. Now in an application like this, I would strongly recommend making sure you get all that putty out of this housing. It's not the kind of thing I think you'd want floating around in there. Hell, it may be the reason this lens is zoom is frozen anyway, for all I know. And I cannot, I've already lost track of that screw. That screw is gone. Here, there it is. All right, got lucky. It fell out. So I didn't didn't lose it, but didn't keep the best track of it either. All right, so now we're getting a lot looser now. Again, slow and easy. Taking lots of video here to make sure you know how things are layered. You know, specifically this ribbon with the blue, black, blue, and white wires on it is behind this circuit board, but it is above facing out from this circuit board. So when you go to put this back together, you're going to have to make sure to route that in the same place. I may have to untape this anyway, just to figure out if I can unhook that black, blue, and white wire. From what I can see right here, they sure look to be soldered. So we may have to leave this all connected to that until we figure out how to get this ribbon tape out from wherever it goes down in there. So moving forward here, I can see that this piece is, is loose past this circuit board, so it does not appear to be connected to. There's two screws behind here. Remember we talked about this earlier. This circuit board has two screws, and the heads are covered up by this piece. So I can't get them out yet. This end of the circuit board is just not as, I think it's the adhesive that's holding it on there. So I'm going to try and, that one screw still had a little bit of adhesive. Okay. As you can see, this entire piece is semi-free now. The, only, the last piece I need to try to figure out here is One problem I have is this right here. There's a pink and a white wire that come up from here, goes across here, and connects back to this circuit board. But it's called in the scotch tape, so I'm only removing the scotch tape to get those two wires loose. And then I'm going to stick it back down because those two wires should not have been stuck up in that scotch tape to begin with. Very slow and easy. This is not something you want to just reach in there and try to yank it out. All right. So now I've got another ribbon cable in there. I still haven't figured out. Right, so it looks like everything is loose on this side except for that three conductor black, blue, white ribbon cable. Here, I 
Now we're getting somewhere. All right, so now that I got enough slack in here where the pink and white wires are, I can see that back in there behind it, I don't know if you can see that from the camera or not, but right down in there behind it, there's another screw down here. That screw holds this circuit board in place, so that's, that's the next one coming out. We have to remember to put it back together in this order because you won't be able to do this out of order. That hole in that screw will be hidden up at that point. You won't be able to get to it. Okay. There we go. Now that screw, again, is a different sized screw. It's a black screw, but it's about the same size as the silver screw we pulled out earlier. So it's a little bit bigger than the other five we've taken out. So we need to, need to be very wary of that. Because this, this type of thing is not impossible to index it, but you just need to remember that the big black screw came out from behind the pink and white wire. There you go. Sounds like a nursery rhyme. Alright, so now we're, we're getting closer. Now moving on back around to the other end of the pink and white wire, there's another screw back here that was hidden before. So we're getting we're getting closer. We're gonna take this screw out now. That releases the circuit board that's hiding two other screws. Now this is a screw that matches the last screw we took out. It's a, oop, and I lost it. About to hit my finger, I think. Okay, it's, there it is, came out. It is again a black headed screw that is larger than the first five we took out. So we're gonna keep those two Try to keep those two together in our storage device. Okay. Now you gotta be very gentle at this point because you've got a lot of very fragile pieces like these electrical connectors right here. Those brushes are very fragile. But at this point, this entire piece of electronics is loose except for those three wires connected to the ribbon cable. Now, something else we want to do at this point. There is a little white boss here that comes out of what I'm assuming is attached to the focus ring that is between these forks here. And I am sure that that needs to go back in that same way at some point. And not moving this piece, the, the focus ring much. I'm moving it back and forth just to see if any of the screws we've removed so far were tying any pieces together in here. And it does not appear that they were. So at this point, we need to investigate what we're going to do about the black, blue, and white wires. Where does that ribbon cable go? really don't want to get into cutting wires and soldering them back together here. I'm not above it, I'm not beneath it, but it sure would be a good option right now. All right, Nikon, how come you didn't help me out here? At this point, I, I'm not a big proponent of pulling off one of these rings without seeing what's behind the rubber that's on it. So at this point, I'm going to take the rubber off the focus ring. Could probably do a better job of it than I am. One thing I do wish I had, I've seen other people using is a set of dental picks. But like I said at the beginning of this video, this is hillbilly camera repair. Yeah, 
looks like this has some adhesive in a couple of spots like the other ring did. Yeah. I just be a lot more comfortable to know that there's not a screw in this thing before I start trying to take it apart. And there's a hole there that may go to something. But that's it. No screws behind that one. So unless I eventually have to take a screw out through this hole, you folks all know you do not need to do what I just did. screws in there that I can see so that didn't help a bit flinging flinging so let's see if this is a focus ring it's got a little bit of play in it at this point but it just doesn't quite yet feel like it's ready to be removed All right, break time again, back in five. All right, no great revelations yet, but I did discover that there is another ribbon cable that is still attached to the circuit board from the housing. I'm trying to get this in the light for you folks. Right here, it comes off of these strips, it comes down, there's a ribbon cable here that hooks around and is attached to the circuit board here with another one of the ribbon connectors. So I'm going to unhook that. And if you remember, we popped the little teeth out from the connector and that releases the ribbon cable. Ooh, I just want to be a little more gentle than I'm being right now. There is not a piece of aluminum that is completely made out of a ribbon connector material, ribbon tape material. So I'm going to need to be a little bit more gentle than I have been with it. It's very hard to get to. Actually, all right, there's actually two back here. I can see another one now. But one of them just goes over and connects back to something on the circuit board so we don't need to disconnect that one. The only one we need to disconnect is this one. I'm hoping this is coming through on this. Move the light around a little bit here and see if it helps. Right here. This is the one we need to disconnect, the one on the end. I'm going to try to do it with my fingernail. There, I got one side. You want to be a lot more gentle with this than you were with the ribbon cables that are attached to this sheet of aluminum. You can now see a lot better. I can really see where this would, this part could go south. Okay, I did not break that white wire you just saw flip up there. That's that ground wire that you need to make sure you reconnect or reground under the screw later. So no, I haven't screwed up that bad yet. But maybe if we try to pinch this connector between your fingers very gently push down on that finger on the end of it and it figures that would be the one that's just tighter and I'll get out I got half of it loose it did looks like it popped back into place all right got that one loose again Alright, I got it now. You ever doing this and you start feeling frustrated? Put your tools down, take a break, 
get up, walk around. One thing I've learned through the years, you keep fooling with something like that when you get overly frustrated, you're going to break it. You're going to break it good. All right. I've gotten access to what I needed to get access to. I can try to continue to do this entire operation with these three wires still connected, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time here seeing if I can get them unconnected because this stuff's all so fragile. I, it bothers me a little bit trying to keep it here, hanging here like this. But like I said earlier, I have the ability. All right, I got a phone call. I don't know how much I lost. But what I was saying was I have the ability to work on the housing now with these three wires still connected really don't want to yet i want to be able to get this free out of the way it's a little fragile for me to be wanting to work around very much but i just don't see how i'm going to do it because those daggone wires looking down in looking down in between here they sure look like they're soldered over here and I cannot imagine why Nikon decided to solder those wires on both ends instead of including a connector. So what that tells me is that piece of ribbon wire goes somewhere. We need to figure out what piece I have to disconnect to get that ribbon wire loose. I can't see where that thing actually goes. It, 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 it could be the connector for this ring here that has, I don't know how to describe this, has a solid strip and then very fine strips out here that are connected by this brush over here that I really can't figure out exactly what it is it, it does. But I imagine it has something to do with the, the focus. I can't figure out exactly what it is that attaches these two pieces, but at this point I'm going to take, I'm going to remove this piece. Um, not that I necessarily know at what point that piece will have to be removed, but at this point I'm going to take a stab in the dark. I'm going to pop it off here and we're going to see what happens. And I'm going to move on to my next storage bin with these screws even though I think they match some of the screws we just removed a minute ago. I'm going to move on to my next one here. And again, another good reason to remove this is these tines. They look very fragile. Yeah, I could easily see myself grabbing a hold of this piece in a way that um, would damage those pieces. I'll be kind of careful with the magnet here. I don't want to pull the whole piece out with the magnet, just the screw. Now remember this piece, when it goes back in, there's a plastic boss here that looks like it's attached to the focus ring that we need to be absolutely sure when we put it back together that those forks go over that little white boss right there. This piece. Okay. Well, for now I'm going to leave this attached for a moment. I'm really curious about the zoom on this. You remember that first piece we took out, the piece that I called our, our first suspect? That piece, I'm going to pull it back out here so you can to help you remember, but this piece here, our initial primary suspect. This piece actually situated right here. You can see the tines on it. 
right on these strips here but more importantly I remember that's the piece that was screwed to the zoom ring right so you can see here this boss is attached to the piece that's inside this helical slot it sticks out and it rides inside the slot in our prime suspects. Our prime suspect no longer being the prime suspect. I'm just going to keep calling it that. But, so this isn't the issue. I just wanted to get it back out and show you that this piece here, when you grab a hold of the zoom ring and you twist it, it's pushing this sideways in a way that it can still slide up and down in this slot as it rotates through that helical. But it is still stuck. It, it won't move I can't I can't force it manually I don't I don't want to take a good whack at it although at this point it sure is tempting but there's there's several of these in here and that one right there I can't exactly figure out it seems a little odd to me that what is it in here that needs to move just that teeny little bit from here to here I mean it barely Barely has any move that way, but I'm sure there's good reason for it. But it is still stuck, so there's something inside this. Yep, we're going to get down inside of this thing at some point. I think at this juncture, I don't know, don't know the names of, any of these pieces, but I think it's a good time to take this piece off. It seems to connect make an electrical connection from here to this housing which is feels like aluminum and then it had the ribbon cable here that plugged into this as well so but again being another tiny fragile piece I think this is in one of the, as you can see one screw is already out of it one screw was under one of the other screws that I've already removed I'm going to reach around here with this finger and hold this piece in place well, to keep it from spinning while I loosen this screw up. And we're going to take this whole piece out. interesting this ribbon cable has a turn down here that I sure hope it wasn't connected to something it seems odd that it would be shaped like this it comes out and half of it turns down but it has a piece of tape on there like it was taped off and didn't go to anything actually I can tell it didn't go to anything because it's not stripped there's no connectors there to access, so we're good there. I still can't get a good read on where that last three conductor ribbon cable goes. It's getting more and more tempting to unsolder it. focus ring still acts like it's ready to come off but it's it's not it is attached to something at this point it's also it's come partially up on this side like it came a little bit off all right break time again all right well we're back i figured out a couple of small things but i haven't figured out the problem yet first thing i found is that you can 
once you get the lens apart to this point, if you noticed I've got it, the zoom working. The only way I got it working though was by pushing down on the rear element and in on the front element at the same time. And when you do that, you can see this boss right here. And you really got to push on it pretty good. You set it down the table and mash down on it. You can see at that point, you can make the zoom work, but I'm pushing way harder than you'd ever want to turn on the zoom ring. And another thing I found here is that down inside this groove down here, there's a couple of very fine brass shims in there that are just itching to get out. Every time I lean this thing over the wrong way or something, they, of course, I'm not going to do it now that I got the camera back on. There's one of them. See it? Right there, that thing is so small and so thin though, I'm really very leery of putting any pressure on it to get it out. Because good luck getting that thing to lay down flat again later. But by just moving the focus ring up and down and trying to introduce a little bit of slack in it by pushing on the other side, and get them to fall out. But again, don't pry on them. You want to remove these by pushing on the sides of the focus ring. So, and then once you get them off, you can very carefully feed them over all the electronics and get them out. And once again, you're going to lay them over here, indexing them over here with all your other pieces where you can put them back together in that same order you disassembled it. And then the other thing I discovered is that, I mean, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the video, one issue I've got with this lens is, is contamination. It's got some dust in there. It's got a, it's got a downright severe amount of dust. So I, I need to disassemble the lenses at some point in this as well. And I don't have a lens wrench. So I'm, I'm going to be at some point, I'm sure, up against buying a lens wrench or figuring out another way to get them apart. But I did discover that the rear element here, you can just grab a hold of it. And I believe there's two lenses inside this piece, but the whole piece comes off. You can see there's a joint in it where I suspect there's a second lens in there. And I'll be able to clean this before I reassemble it. I'm going to set that over there out of the way. And then down inside here, there is another shim. So while I still got your camera on so you can see it, I'm going to take this shim out. And I'm going to set it right on top of the lens. See, to store it, I, you can see I've set it right on top of this. I should have done that where y'all could see it. But there it is. So you just, I'm going to put it where it belongs so when I go to pick it up and put it back together, I can't forget it. Now, at this point, the other thing I did also find out is this, this red substance. I believe it's an adhesive and a thread locker, so that's why it was on all the, all the little tiny screws that I pulled out. So I'm suspecting at some point before I reassemble this, I'm going to need to find some kind of a very lightweight thread locking fluid to put on them. Um, also, the only other thing I discovered is that these pieces here, which... This, this is a spring, and this aluminum piece down here, you can see it's loose in there, and it's pushed down by the spring in that direction against these, these little wheels in here. I haven't yet figured out what that's for, but my next focus when I turn the, the camera off again is I'm going to try to figure out how to get the focus ring off and see if that gets, gains me access to hopefully be able to get this ribbon loose and if that doesn't work I think I'm going to go get my soldering gun and just unsolder those three wires before I cause any damage. So I'm going to turn the camera off back to you in five. Alright I'm going to attack this from the other side at this point. I'm going to take the front element off and see what I can get to from here. I haven't been able to get the focus ring to give any leeway so and again I don't have a lens wrench which might have come in really helpful here but did find out that this 
ring does not seem to be that tight. So I can only assume that I'm unscrewing this at this point. If not, I'm just sitting here spinning it in vain. And yeah, I've gotten quite a few fingerprints on there, which I'm not proud of, but I would recommend getting yourself some gloves when you do this. I did make sure my hands were free of grit. I mean, the last thing I want to do is scratch up the front element of this lens while I'm doing this. I'll scratch up any element, but I do need to find, you know, two goals here. We're going to fix the zoom, and we're going to find out where all that, that dust contamination is inside this lens. So if I get lucky, I won't need to take the lens completely apart to get to the contamination, which let's see what we got here. Oh yeah, there's a lot of dust in here. Get me a lens cloth and wipe that off and see what we Oh yeah, I can see quite a bit of pieces disappear right there, but I can also see that it looks like there's some of the dust is actually inside this lens. There's, there's two elements in here. Okay, that one looks clean. I don't, I don't think I'm going to need to disassemble this. I just have to make sure that when I reassemble it, there isn't any dust on the back surface of this group. And I'll definitely have to clean the front of the lens a lot better than that. But there does not seem to be any dust contamination inside this group. So I'm going to set this. Hmm. I'll set this over here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it down like this. I don't want to set it down on either of the lenses. So I'm gonna prop that one up on the side a little bit. Now, focusing back in here again. One thing I want to be darn sure of when I put this back together, there is another brass shim in here that I'm gonna very carefully remove. And I'm gonna set it on top of that lens group I just pulled out so that I can't put it back together and forget it. Now I can see more dust down inside here. There's there's some dust down in there. I know you can't see this on the camera, but and this had no effect. The air is not, not doing it. So wherever this contamination is, and I can see looking through the lens, the majority of the contamination I'm concerned about is still in there. There's some pretty big flakes in there. I would say there's about 10 specks in there that are about a third of a millimeter square, roughly. <laughs> They're not in this area. Now there are, down inside here, you can see there's three sets of two screws each, which I can only suspect the front housing here connects to this piece. I think this piece must go down through here and have a flange that sticks out and these screws thread into this piece somewhere down inside of there. So I don't think there's any electronics in here. I don't think there's any need to try to disassemble this from this side any further. So honestly, I think at this point the best answer here, and I'm going to make sure that there's nothing on the surface of this lens in here. I think the best thing I can do here is go ahead and reassemble the front of this lens, cover this back up and protect it, and put the lens cap back on.
and then I, I'm 90% sure at this point that we won't need to access the front end of this lens again. So we don't need to take this, this lower housing off here. We need to figure out what's wrong inside of it, and I, I don't, I really don't believe, I hope that we're not going to need to disassemble any of these items down inside of here. The, that, that next lens there does have two divots for a lens wrench in it, and I hope I don't need to get those apart. I really don't know if I'll be able to without going and buying a, a real, genuine, actual spanner type lens wrench. Well, they did the. Uh, I was able to twist it a little bit, but I'm not twisting. I'm twisting the entire housing. I'm not twisting that one lens group. And I suspect that I, what I'm probably doing here is. This maybe had to do with the focusing mechanism. I have to tell you, it sure is moving a lot more freely than it did when I started to move it. Almost feels like there's a rattle in there. You can see this, but I'm spinning this, this lens group in here has a divot that I've got the tip of a Phillips screwdriver in. It was very difficult to move when I started. Now it's moving very easily. So I'm going to reassemble this front element, which fell over while I did all this. It's still clean. Place that shim very carefully where it belongs. I'm not going to force this in any way. Put that shim in there. I'm going to make very sure that we're not in any way compressing or bending that shim. doing this you want to go very easy as you thread it on you don't want to overpower anything if you can't spin it with your thumbnail for I'd say a good three full turns you probably have it cross threaded and you don't want to keep forcing it now, I realize that needs to be tightened up a whole lot better than I've done it so far, but I'm not going to do that until I reassemble the entire lens. Because there's as good a chance as any that I'm going to wind up having to take that back out. So now at this point, I can tell you that the, the zoom is still sticking. I don't remember exactly which direction that is. When you turn this all the way in this direction, which would be a little bit lost here. Where's the ring? Oh, here we go. Which would be to 17 millimeters. When you turn that all the way to 17 millimeters, that's where it's stuck. Once you get it off the, seven, the 17 millimeter stop, if you can, <laughs> it frees up and is, is you're able to move it at that point. But when it's at 17, it is stuck pretty good. There we go. Push down and turn clockwise on this housing, this internal housing comes off the 17 millimeter stop and it is still very difficult to get 
get up, I would say somewhere past 20 or 24. Somewhere in there. Yeah, somewhere around 23 millimeters is where it frees up and you can actually move it. So at some point here, I think we're going to have to get this lens group, housing, and aperture group out. And in order to do that, all these guides or bosses on the side that are in these helical slots, and even the ones in the vertical slots, we're going to have to take all of these out. How in the world I'm going to figure out which one of those goes back and which one will be a lot of indexing and reference. I may even have to turn the video camera off to take a few pictures through this process. Because whatever it is that's binding up is in here. So I think the first thing we're going to do is take this this piece off here. It's just a metal piece. It's got a vertical rod that goes down in there. It's not really in the way now, but I know that at some point it will be. So we're going to start off taking the two Phillips screws out that hold it in. Side of screw from the last piece which we took out. Number two. And theoretically this piece comes right out. Now one thing I will tell you is that there is more play in the slot of this piece. Something gets calibrated by adjusting this. There's two screws that go in there, but the slot is longer than the distance from the outside to the outside of the screw holes. And I can tell you on my lens here, it's centered. So that's how I'm going to put it back, is centered. That, that piece there, it rides down in there and there's, there's some kind of a finger down in there that controls the aperture. So that's an aperture link. There's, a, there's several different fingers in here that both actually do the same thing. One of those is, I'm sure, for the manual control of the aperture. And the other one must be to, is, is for this piece here. This piece can push on one of the fingers to open it. And the piece we just took out stayed in place to open it as it zoomed in and out. Which I would suspect is the reason why this is tapered and has these odd notches in it. Someone's figured out exactly what shape that needs to be to maintain the aperture opening as the lens is zoomed. And back to the point here where I sure could use a lens wrench. I believe the next piece that I unscrew here is going to be the piece that holds the aperture. I really feel like that whole thing needs to come out as a group, which means I think the next thing I'm going to need to do is start pulling these boss screws out or sliders, or I'm not sure what they're called. And before I get too far into this, and again, when I start taking these out, every single one of them I take out, I'm going to check the zoom operation. Because it may be that one of these is the problem. It could be turned in too far riding against something on the inside. So every one of those screws you touch, I would strongly recommend checking the zoom operation. I can tell you it's not that one. 
first one I'm taking out is the the one that's controlled by the fork, the, the initial suspect that we had, and it has a longer head on it. So I'm going to pull it out first. There, and it doesn't have a lot of thread on it, so when you take these out, you can see, I hope you can see, not a lot of thread sticking out of that thing. back in. Since that's the one that actually controls the zoom by sliding in the initial suspect bracket we took out, that's the one I'm going to need to be able to put my fingernail against and try to turn it as we take the others out. So without something to push on to see if we've loosened up the zoom, sure how else we would actually test the zoom. So now I'm going to go to the exact opposite side. You know, first thing I have to do is to get that zoom back down. So I'm going to force that down so that I have access to this one. This one is the one that is in the other helical slot. I feel like it's the next one that needs to come out. see much smaller much thinner much smaller looks like it's a steel screw that goes through a, some kind of a brass 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 boss might even be plastic or nylon that one's that one has a black bushing on it so the one in the helical on this side has a very thin brass, or I mean, uh, sorry, black in color bushing on its head. If we go back now, so there's three of those. Now, if we try the zoom, and the only way to really try it is to go all the way out to 17 millimeters. That's where it was getting stuck. And nope, I can't push it. So now I'm going to take the second of three of the helical. The boss is out. And it looks identical. Very thin black in color boss head with a steel screw in it. So hopefully it won't matter which slots those two go back in. They are, they are identical. We'll go back and check the zoom again. Still no luck. So now we have another set of bosses that are purely vertical. And there are two of them. So those are going to be the next ones I take out. You see, this is a purely vertical slider right here. Go straight down. I'll move the light here and try to adjust the reflection. So I'm going to take these two out next. The, these little ones here, they actually go through the outer, the, the outer housing, the mid housing, into the inner housing. So I want to save those for last. Plus they have a much shorter throw, but there it appears there's another helical slot cut in the middle housing 
and this controls the middle housing helical slot. So I'm going to skip that and I'm going to go right to the, the two vertical slots. see if one of these is causing the issue. I kind of doubt the vertical slot bosses are causing the issue. I just don't think they, they have the ability to cause that much resistance. Right, so these are much longer. With a very short thread and looks like a steel screw through a white nylon bushing. As you can see, it is much longer than the two black ones that I took out. So now, we're going to check the zoom. Nope, still stuck. And we'll come around here and take the second vertical thread out. The vertical thread. It's in the vertical slot. It appears to be identical. The one we took out of the first vertical slot. So I'm going to remove that, and yes, it again is identical. You see there, it's the same one. Check the zoom again. Nope. Still stuck. Alright, so we're getting close here. There are two, one, two, there are three. There are three of these slots. Which, sorry, I'm trying to remember to focus this thing. There are three that look like this. So I'm going to take these three out next. They appear to go through this little slot here, through a helical slot in the middle housing, into and then thread into the internal housing, which I believe is the aperture housing. And again, each one of these I remove, I'm going to check the zoom using my thumb to push on the boss that sticks out back into the bracket. We're still calling the initial suspect bracket. I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to guess these are even a little bit longer and I'd be wrong. This one appears, first glance, let's see here. Yes, these are these are identical. So again, we're kind of lucky there in that when we go to put these back together, you're going to have five identical white bosses, boss screws, shoulder screws. I'm not real sure what those things are called. So I'm going to flip this around here, and I'm going to take the second one out. Oh. And I actually just see where I missed a vertical one. One of the vertical slots still has one of these screws in it. So we'll get it next. Okay. Alright, so again that's identical. That's four identical shoulder screws. We're going to check the zoom. Nothing. Now you can probably see why I missed it. It's hiding behind this ribbon tape. Okay, and again it it appears. And it is. Again, it's the same size as the first ones we've removed. Same one, same type. And we're going to check the zoom. Still nothing, it still froze up hard. So, this is the last one. Again, this is one of the ones that goes through the outer housing, this little keyhole slot, through a helical slot in the middle housing, and is threaded into the inner housing, which I suspect has the aperture assembly and again same type so this makes six identical these nylon steel shoulder screws 
with a nylon nylon bushing over a steel shoulder screw. And we'll check the zoom. Nope. So now we're going to take the last one out. In theory, I think the entire housing may be able to slide all the way out once we remove this last screw. We'll be able to take the entire and this is the one that we have to keep in mind is you now this may just be some discoloration but this actually it looks to be a little bit off white but it is also as you can see hopefully you can see that it is just a hair longer you have to keep in mind that's the one that goes in the slot right here it goes in this this hole don't focus for me there you go right below this cutout goes in this hole is where the long one goes no uh -oh. As I stand this up, I heard something slide down and go plop. As you take this out, you want to keep a good eye out. You want to see if there's any kind of contamination, which I think I know where the dust contamination came from. There's a lot of dust right here. You can see that on my finger. That's just that's all coming off of all these helical slots. There's something in there that is you can see some on my thumb here too. There's something in there that's just fitting a little bit tight. And if you look, see if I can actually get this on the screen focused. There's a lot of scuffs right here. See them there. There's a lot of some kind of contamination here, whether it's metal shavings or dirt, right at the edge of these scuffs, up on this this bevel, up past this surface, there's a lot of just contamination buildup. You see it right here. See that contamination there? Comes off on my finger. I truly hope and suspect that a good cleaning is going to put this back in order. Right there you can see this. And I was right, my suspicion was lucky, but this is the aperture housing. And it looks like this lens and the lens below it, the, the lens that is still down inside of here, that lens right there that I'm trying to center up in the picture, there's a lens down in there that I can't really get any light on. That lens in there, I know you can't see it on the camera. That's where all the contamination is that I'm seeing when I was looking through this lens before I took it apart. There's a lot of just... And when you get down here and you find stuff like this, don't stick your finger down in there and rub it. Don't stick a cloth down in there and rub it. I don't have any, but if I need to, I'm going to make up some cleaning solution. This is not something you want to any friction on when you go to clean it out. I may even go and get me a can of that keyboard cleaner stuff and blast the whole inside of this thing out before I reassemble it. But this is, um, yeah, there's a couple of flakes in there that I, hmm, I'm not 100% convinced they're on this side of that lens. So I may have to see if I can get that lens out and get to the other side of it. My eyes aren't what they once were and they, it looks like it's on this side. Okay, I got one flake to move. But there's one piece in there that really looks like it's on the other side of that lens. And I may have the same issue with this lens. The lens right beside the aperture. And a lot of the contamination is disappearing as I do this, but also appears there may be some on the side where the aperture housing is. I'm not sticking my finger in here and trying to move these these aperture blades. Yeah this is this is going to take quite a bit of cleaning to get this all back in order. Now, I've gotten lucky so far. I have not had to 
I've not had to desolder the was that blue, black, and white wires? Yeah, blue, white, and black wires. They're they're still connected. Got to constantly be aware of that and not not tug on those wires or damage that ribbon cable. Even right there, I don't know if you can see if I can get this to focus. Right there, you see that black spot right in the middle of that scuff mark? It looked like there's some contamination in there that may have been the initial cause. I can even catch my fingernail on that. Anything you can catch your fingernail on is a big problem when you're dealing with machine surfaces like this. If you can touch it with your fingernail, you believe you me, it'll hang that thing up in a heartbeat. That's a pretty rough little spot. I may have to try to get some some kind of thinner. And if you've never done any machine work, I do not recommend you do this. But it actually feels like it may be a pit, which won't be a problem. But I'm going to definitely, before we reassemble it, I'm going to need to make darn sure that that's not contamination. This is going to need to be thoroughly cleaned. So I would suspect the fella I bought this lens from on eBay at some point probably got this thing really dirty or took it into a, some kind of a manufacturing environment with a lot of floating manufacturing type dust. It doesn't look like beach sand. You probably see a lot of these with beach sand all over the place. The only other, one other thing I'm going to do here, while well, I still got you on camera, and like I, I think I mentioned before that focus ring here at one point it, it started to separate, or not separate, it started to, to come off. I never could get it to come all the way off. I, I tried and tried. So I think what I'm going to do while I'm off camera is I'm going to fiddle with this and I'm going to squeeze and pop and somewhat gently I'm going to try to persuade that to go back into place. I don't think we're going to need to remove that at this point. And then while I still have you on the camera here, being very careful not to drop these pliers because there is an exposed lens in there. I'm going to grab... Okay, so yes, that piece will come out as well. So, looking down inside here, I'm going to grab this over here in this slot and I'm going to lift it up and out. Well, it's coming out with the bigger pliers. Alright, so that bar right there see that bar right there, I know it's hard to see but it sticks up out of this assembly. That, that piece needs to stay in place sliding it over the bar you can remove this next lens group very carefully this is a plastic housing and uh, it's actually aluminum and you can see here there's some places where it's it's been rubbed pretty hard now this this also could be another symptom of hey something's wrong down inside there or there's some contamination inside there that's causing some of these friction issues a little bit rough on the surface here alongside these helixes. And again, we have another another piece here that's got this bossed screw, shoulder screw with the nylon bushing on it. This piece feels like it moves pretty good, but while I'm off camera, I'm going to take a little time to do some very th thorough investigation. I'm going, to clean, I'm going to clean these lenses very well, and if I have to, I'm going to go get some alcohol and make up some cleaning fluid. You can find that recipe anywhere on the internet. I have yet to ever actually need it. I've had pretty good luck using a very gentle hand soap and just washing lenses with my fingers. Now, I know there's going to be some purists out there that tell me I'm an idiot, but it works for me every time. But always start with this first. That's your first means of cleaning a lens. Never use your t-shirt first. You probably shouldn't use your t-shirt at all, but there's one flake on there that I really doubt you can see in the in the video. Right about just a little bit 
Let me turn it around. At 12 o'clock, about 20% of the way up or 15% of the way up from the center, there is a there's a flake there that I just cannot get to come off with the blower. It actually looks like this lens group has two lenses in it. I may have to look at trying to disassemble it. Come to find out, this is actually the back of the lens that, if you recall a little while ago, I was trying to spin from behind the front element. So this, this is that lens. And if you remember, I said when I had the front element out, I said, well, it, there's some more contamination on the back side of that lens. Well, this is the back side of that lens. It's right there. Hopefully it's coming through on the camera. Right there is the divot that I had my screwdriver in when I was trying to spin it from the other side. Okay, so I'm going to turn off the camera. I'm going to do some cleaning. I'm going to do a little bit of investigating. I'm going to look at the inside of this housing as well. Because as you can see on my finger there, there's quite a bit of dust down inside there. What I'm going to be looking for is evidence of friction and wear and to see if there's anything that's bent anywhere. This little rod down in here. And there's anything that anything that might be bent or damaged is what I'm going to be looking for. Absent finding anything, any damage, I'm going to clean out every bit of contamination I can get to. And then I'm going to do what I call temporary reassembly, which just means I'm going to put this in there and try to spin it and slide it up and down and see if there's any points where I'm experiencing some friction. So I'm going to do all that. I'm going to get back to you probably tomorrow. I'm about done with this for the day. See you later. Hey folks, I'm back. I learned quite a bit since yesterday. Uh, I want to start off with, you can see i got a new tool here. Um, I did find out you don't use thread locker on these small minuscule screws. You install the screw dry and then you put a drop, small drop of varnish or fingernail polish on it to hold it on the head. Uh, you don't put it on the threads. Um, so one thing I'm going to do right here to start, just to help me, I, I've cleaned everything very well. I've inspected everything as best I could. Um, one thing I'm going to do to start, this is, I found out this is called a helicoid. And I'm going to reassemble the rear element back into this. Um, just mostly to give me something to hold on to it as I reinstall it. Um, so I'm going to reassemble that and then I'm going to put a drop of fingernail polish on here. Because um, that's how you keep these things from coming loose. Yes, that's enough. You don't have to put a wrench on something like that. That's the whole idea of using the quote thread locker. It doesn't take much, and you can even see here where someone put it on when this was originally assembled, I imagine. Just just about that much. That's how much was on there before. And then as you reassemble the tiny screws, you just put one drop on one side of the screw head. I've noticed most of them weren't completely covered. Um, so now that I've showed you that, I've also got some white lithium grease. Um, these surfaces, as I reinstall them, I'm going to put the smallest amount possible of grease on there with a brush. Um, Everywhere I read anything about this, they said you want trace amounts. You don't actually want enough to be, even be able to see, really. Some people even said to put it on there and then wipe it off real quick. And then what was left was the trace amount that you needed. So I'm going to start working on putting these together. And unfortunately, I didn't think to index this piece. Like I kept warning you folks over and over to index everything. I didn't remember how to index this or the aperture. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to figure that out, and then I'm going to come back and show you when I know what I'm doing. All right, I figured out a few things here. I haven't started reassembly yet, but remember I said I lost track of the indexing of these two pieces. I have figured out the indexing of the aperture, and I only figured it out because I indexed all these other pieces that I set out here, and I discovered that the aperture has three tines that stick up here you have there's one here that can make the aperture larger the aperture in its natural relaxed state is about 
halfway, I guess that'd be you know, about F11. This time we'll, we'll open it. If you push the, this time in this direction, it makes it smaller. So your natural reaction would be to take the, the aperture ring itself, the control ring, and drop that fork right down in between those but it doesn't work because if you try to push these two tines that are right smack up against each other, they won't move in that direction. This one will still open the aperture. This way won't. And I discovered that when you, when you reassemble this aperture ring, this fork, or whatever you want to call that, needs to go in between these two tines right here. So this is going to be way down inside there, and when you reassemble that, and that's probably why one of these two tines here, if I can get it to focus, I don't know if you can actually see that or not, but one of these two tines right here is actually just a millimeter longer than the other so that you can push it over and see those two spread out, and I hope this is coming through on the camera. So when you reassemble the fork on the aperture control ring, you're going to have to make sure it goes down in between those two tines. If you pull one over, see it'll open up into a gap just large enough for this fork to go down in between there. And then when you control it with the aperture ring, you can see that you now have the full range of the aperture control. So that because I had set this piece down indexed in the correct orientation, I know that this fork is at about 1030 on the clock dial. So that means that this needs to be around 1030 on the clock dial when it's fully assembled in the helicoid. It's going to need to be in that direction. So, see? Indexing can save your ass when you're doing this stuff. Now, I've still got to work on how to index this one. I don't think it'll be too hard. But before I get into that, I'm going to set these aside and show you something I discovered while I was investigating that. I wasn't very careful with this piece when I took it off the camera and I discovered when I started looking at it to figure out the indexing here that if you notice this has almost like a planetary reduction in it. Turning this ring about 30 degrees from 2.8 to f22 only elicits, if you watch the, the fork there, I hope it's focusing, it only elicits maybe a 10 degree rotation. So there's a planetary reduction or a helical reduction that's done by this wedge right here. And I notice when I pick it up that, oh my gosh, the thing comes apart. I didn't even know that. So it took me a little while to figure out how to put this back together and I thought I'd share it with you in case it happens to you. Um, right here, there's a little piece on a swivel that has a couple of little knobs sticking up. And your natural reaction is to put that over here but that's the wrong direction. That needs to go in this direction, but not until after you move this little stop on the inner ring out of the way. And then this goes against the stop, and then put a finger up through the middle and hold the stop, push this over, and you're gonna drop this ring over. And once you get it set in the right spot, it'll just snap right back into place and you can release the inner ring against that little swivel with the two knobs on it. And now you can see, let me get some light on this just right here. The little knobs here, the larger of the two knobs rides against this wedge, the smaller knob rides against the stop on the inner ring so that as you rotate this ring, you can see that's where your angular rotation reduction comes into play by those little knobs sliding on those two pieces. Let's see if I can get a better shot of that. See the two little knobs right here? One rides on the wedge, the other knob rides on the stop on the inner ring that controls, actually has the rod that sticks down and controls the aperture assembly. So that's how it looks when you've got it back together properly. And the other piece I'm not going to bother to show you, but the lock will actually fall out there also if this comes apart on you. It's got a little angular spring on the back. Just slide it back into the slot, slip this back in the slot, and then put this over it. So just in case that happens to you, that's how you put it back together.
All right, you folks ready for some more? I figured out a little bit more here. This is the focus group. This lens right here sliding in this helicoid, moving up and down, is controlled by the focus ring. If you look down inside the main body, I'm going to shine a flashlight down in there. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. But that... That little rod right there, the rod that sticks up and is free, you can see it moves around. That rod is connected to this ring right here, which when you put the little bracket on here with the forks on it that hits this little white peg, these two pieces are tied together. This is your focus ring. That rod, when you reassemble this, needs to fit right in this slot right here. It's got a little spring to keep a little bit of tension on it. And when that rod turns back and forth, you can see it moves that lens up and down to focus your image. So I know that from the indexing I've discovered, that rod needs to go through here. So I'm going to line this up right with that little screw. And that, that screw goes through here. I believe. Or no, I'm sorry. That goes through the verticals. So we're going to turn that screw around this way. So now this screw is going to go in this vertical slot. And that rod, which is right about here right now, which I'm going to move around to here, will now line right up with that slot when I drop this piece in. The aperture, we figured out the indexing based on these, need to line up with where this piece winds up. And I kept this index when I took it apart. And then this middle helicoid, I'm going to make up words here, has one vertical slot in it. And that vertical slot when you reassemble this, and I hope you can see this, right there, right here, there's a vertical rod that looks to be possibly spot welded to the inside of this cage. And as you can see, the inside of this cage has some pretty serious scuffs on it. I hope this comes through in the video, but it's got some pretty serious scuffing going on there, but it still feels smooth. You can't catch your fingernail on it. I'm hoping that we're going to be all right here, and it was just the contamination that was binding this focus group up. But I've cleaned the inside of this out. I've cleaned all the lenses as clean as I can get them, except for this one. This is this is the rear lens, and I'm going to be handling this quite a bit, so I'll clean that when I've got the lens all reassembled. But what I've kind of figured out here is I'm going to have to lay this down flat. I have to put the aperture in. I put the focus group in, all laid down flat, and then reassemble this flat. When I took it apart, this was the last piece to come out after I pulled this piece up out. This was still down in there. There's no way for me to get that in there over that rod and then assemble this over it. I don't say there's no way. I mean, it might happen, but I think laying this on its side is going to work a little better. So I've got my body indexed again. I'm going to keep all these pieces indexed. And at this point, I'm going to start to put a little bit of grease on there. Everything I have read, which I in no way think this makes me an expert, it says that you're supposed to have very trace amounts. And I'm going to use an artist's brush. But just very trace amounts of lubricant on these surfaces. And they even go so far as to say, put it on and then wipe it off. And what's left is enough. So I'm going to do my best to just put just the slightest little bit of grease on these surfaces. I got some white lithium grease. I'm sure there's better greases out there. Um, Helicoid XP or something like that was one name that popped up on Amazon and some of my searches. I, um, I guess I should be doing this on camera. Sorry, folks. Um... I just don't want to wait for it. 
for one. I'm not sure this is going to work, and if it does work, it needs to be relubed next year. I can take it apart and do it again, and then I'll know better. And I'll have the grease here ready when it's time to do that. I know I've got way too much of this grease on here right now. I'm going to go back and remove some of it on that upper bearing surface. Down here on the bottom, I just I put it on very sparingly. As a matter of fact, I'm going to try to transfer some from the upper surface down here to the bottom surface instead of getting more. And I know I've got way more than trace amounts on here. All right, folks, I'm back. Sorry about that. My uh, timer on my phone went off telling me it was time to get my laundry out of the washing machine. So, all right, so now I'm going to I'm going to slowly remove a little bit of this grease from my fingers. Trace amounts to me seems like not enough. I'm just going by what I've read on several different blogs and websites. And what I have left here, on my fingers, I'm going to dab on these spots on the focus group that exhibit so much. There you go, built in rag, wipe it on my pants. I'm going to actually put a little bit more on here. Just I really feel like this, these spots are so shiny and so worn, I think they need a little bit of extra lubrication. Can't exactly spot where they're rubbing on the inside of the main helicoid, but this should get it wherever it needs to go. If you look in there, I mean, there's just, there aren't spots that I can find that says, hey, I'm rubbing right here, grease me. I'm not putting any grease on this. I don't want any grease on that. I'm going to wipe my hands on my built in rag there again just to make sure. Now we're going to try to get these assembled. This here would be the stressful part, I suppose. Keeping these indexed, I'm going to lay them over on their sides. And I know that. The aperture needs to get into these slots. So it's just going to take a little bit of doing to get that all the way up there. At the same time, trying not to touch the blades on it. Slow and steady, just a little bit of wiggling. And as soon as your screw holes begin to appear in your helicoid there as soon as you get it as soon as you get it just far enough up there to get a screw in there that's as far as you need to go okay now this screw Keep this indexed. <coughs> Excuse me. With the slot at the three o'clock position, I know that this helicoid had the long screw that the initial suspect forked bracket, this thing, fits over. So I know that this one is one of the real ones with the really thin black head on it. one of these so I'm going to use my tweezers here to set it in place and of course it's not where it, quite where it needs to be you got to get it almost dead centered and you can drop this in place and then you're ready to learn how to be more prepared next time and have the right bit in your screwdriver. 
This is uh, 330 seconds, and I think that's the wrong one. This may be a long video at this rate. All right, we got her started. Not going to get that anywhere near what I would describe as a tight finished condition. So we're going to move on to the next one. Again, this is the really thin-headed shoulder screw with the black nylon bushing on it. We dropped it. There we go, Butterfingers. to get that screw hole lined up exactly in the middle before you can even think about dropping the screw into place. I'm not real happy with that one either. I'm sure there's a better way to do this and hopefully somebody will leave it in the comments at some point in my life. <clears throat> but like I said when I started off, this is hillbilly camera repair. Folks like us just aren't scared to take a shot at these things. If somebody put it together, we can take it apart. So close. So close that time. Uh oh. Got it. Again, I'm just running that up snug. We'll tighten those last later. Now the last one there, that's the one that has the key master or the, the driver goes in this slot. So I'm going to leave it out for now. We'll be able to line that up later, I sure hope. Now again, line up my slot at the three o'clock, three o'clock, keeping this indexed. I'm going to lay it over and line this up roughly here and these screws remember we decided need to go this screw is going to need to go through the lower slot and into the vertical slot on the outer housing so this screw's got to line up through two different slots all at the same time. I have to apologize I'm not going to be able to give you a better cam camera angle for this operation. Alright, so what happened here is that focus group did not line up on the fork when I dropped it in there. It pushed it further up into the middle housing. So I'm going to line that fork up dead on that vertical slot. And then I have to make sure that I'll line 
this up this slot here with the spring in it dead on with the screw in that focus housing now theoretically if I keep all that right at 12 o'clock I'll be able to see what I'm doing as I feed it in here now that spring is trying to go on what is now the upper side of that fork so I can since I got it all lined up here I can pull it back out a little bit I can push down on that spring with a screwdriver and get it under that fork and now it's all perfectly lined up I sure wish Nikon would have put a way to detach this stuff sure would have been handy Nikon hint hint so now all I need to be able to do is get that screw in the focus group centered both in the slot in the middle helicoid and in the slot in the outer helicoid all at the same time which is pretty close right now and then get one of these started and once one of them started the other was the others should line up pretty daggone well on their own or at least close enough where you can poke in there with a screwdriver or your pocket knife everybody needs a pocket knife and get them started and looky there folks we got the first screw back in now again, I'm not tightening these up any more than just barely snug at this point. So now I'm going to come around here to the next vertical slot right here. And we'll drop another one in there. It's pretty well lined up at the moment. It's close, not perfect. Again, I can take a pointy little screwdriver here and just barely give it a nudge in the direction it needs to go. Got number two started. Just barely touching. I don't think tight's even a word we can use to talk about how loose I'm leaving those pieces. Oh no. That's not good. Alright, this these brushes. Yep, see now I may have messed up here. These brushes on this piece got caught up in the fo focus ring. Now they don't line up very well with each other. So when I reassemble this piece on that this outer slider here, I'm gonna have to make sure these things are tuned to have just the right amount of pressure. Once again, thanks Nikon. It wouldn't be that hard to be able to put a disconnector here to take that electronic stuff off. Shouldn't complain too much. I'm a big fan of Nikon, so there's always a way to do it better. We'll drop the third one in the vertical slot. Which is behind this ribbon tape. And there she goes. Okay. Now I've got four more of those. Lovely. I'm at a bit of a loss of where two of them are going to are supposed to go. I'm sorry, three of them. I know they go in these keyhole slots, but I don't see Oh, you know what? It's because it's not going to go down far enough right now. I didn't get this. I lost track of my indexing. 
I may have to punish myself for this. All right, there it is. There's my index mark. I've got six o'clock back at my six o'clock. I need to spin this around until it lines up on that fork. Oh, look at there. Drops right into place. Remember there was a fork spot welded to the inside of the housing over here or attached somehow. I don't know exactly how. that much I've got these in the wrong holes. I put the uh, the aperture screws in the wrong way. So I was real slick about this. I could probably figure out a way to fix this without taking it all the way back apart. The screws I put into the aperture housing, which are Right here's one of them. Those screws should have gone into these holes. And then the standard middle length shoulder screw should have gone through this hole into the aperture. I used the right kind of screw. Oh, that's in the focus group. All right, we're going to take this apart and take and try it again. Come back at you in five. All right, I got a better idea here. I've indexed my housing. That puts the spot welded bar at about 330. I've lined up the focus bar at about 930 so that when I drop this housing in, with the slot, I'm going to have it at about 3.30. I'm going to put the focus group in with its respective slot lined up at about 9.30. So I can get that lined up the same way I did before through the slot, the vertical slot. But the other thing I've done is I've left the wrong screws in the aperture. I've left the really thin-headed shoulder screws with the black nylon washer a bushing on them in the aperture in the same slot it was in the last time, but I've slid it all the way down to the bottom. Reason being, that'll hold the aperture in place until we get it in far enough to where it's lined up with the keyhole slot, and then I can take this screw out, put the screw with the longer head in, the medium length head in. So this will hold the aperture in place until we get it lined up to where it needs to be. So that's the idea. It's easy to sit here and talk about execution. Now we got to do it. So again, I'm going to line this up, and I'm going to rotate the inner lens and the focus group up to line up with the screw slot, with the screw hole, which we're going to line up with the vertical slot at, that is at about 10 o'clock. So actually, I'm wrong. I need to line that up that bar in there, that focus bar up at about 10 o'clock, and I'm going to rotate this around to about 10 o'clock so that the slot on the other side will run, still line up with the one at, what did I say it was, at 3.30. So I'm going to lay this back over on its side, keeping that slot for the focus bar right on top now. And right about there, Let me 
things. I've got that lined up. I'm going to drop one of these quote, normal length shoulder screws in there. And once we got that in, Got that piece in. Now I need to push the spring down under the focus bar before we before we try to insert the helicoid the rest of the way. For some reason, it's decided it's going to just get stuck right on the end of the focus bar. screw in there it rotates when you pull it out now so you can't pull it out too far or it doesn't line up in the vertical slot and we'll push on the spring I'm just going to tap on that until I get it lined up underneath that focus bar and there it goes it's lined up perfect now some point here I'm going to have to find where I put the wrong screw in the aperture group and line it up in a place where I can get it out. I just saw that bugger a minute ago. Well, it sure sounded like a good idea. There it is. I to figure out how to get that to the keyhole. Which apparently I can't. <laughs> because those two pieces are rotating. Yeah, because I pulled it too far out. Or if you pull it too far out in this exercise, you've got to make sure that spring gets back under that focus bar. And the focus bar gets in the slot in the focus group, which it did not. Now I'm sure there's an easier way to do this, but given that Nikon likes to keep all their stuff so top secret, I don't know what it is. It sure sounded like a good idea. There's the problem. I put the screw in the wrong hole. Remember we talked about putting the screw in the focus group in the vertical hole. Well, I put it in the helical slot. The whole slot. So, I'm going to slow down here a little bit and think a little bit more about what I'm doing. I'm making sure that the spring is behind the focus bar. And you can move the focus bar around with this ring right here if you can't see it. Alright. I've got the hole, the screw hole in the focus group lined up with the vertical slot. And I'm going to put the screw where it belonged in the first place. Patience is what you got to have to do something like this, folks. If you're in a hurry, put it down and walk away. Come back later. 
probably don't work for this kind of thing. Now, oh, I am so close I can actually see the little teeny black headed nylon screw in the keyhole slot. See how that works? Take your time, slow down, figure it out, walk away if you have to, come back later. Now it's all lined up dead smack perfect. Take this one out, which thinking back on it now, I probably should have gone and found the one hole that's empty first. I can't get the tweezers in there, I'm going to go back to the magnet. Ta-da! So, learn from my mistakes when you're doing this, folks. Look for the empty screw hole in the keyhole slot first and put that screw in before you take one of the black ones out. Alright, so now I've got one of the mid-length screws in the aperture through the keyhole slot through the helical middle helical we'll call it into the aperture ring. Now I'm going to go around and now here's the second keyhole slot with the other black screw in it. I'm going to leave that in place. We'll go back this way and look at there it is. There's a keyhole slot. Lined up with the aperture ring. Perfectly lined up. I'm going to drop this second screw right in there. Did a pretty bad job of that. But Redneck engineering, and it's all lined up perfect. Two. I'm going to go back to the one that has the black head on it. And while you're doing this, I guess I can also, I don't need to be skipping these, but I've got two other screws in the vertical slots that I can start filling those up as well. because they're lined up with the hole in the focus group housing. Now, this is contrary to every other screw on this lens. We are not putting the fingernail polish on these screws because of the nylon washer. There's no way to get to it. Right, that hole's not lined up very good, so I'm going to use the point of a screwdriver and I'm going to wiggle this around a little bit until I can hopefully get that lined up. But you can't use the fingernail polish thread locker on these because it'll just eat the plastic and won't allow these things to move and twist and slide very well either. I'm sure there may be some kind of a torque spec that Nikon's not going to share with us. I'm going to use my best judgment when I put a final tightening on these. I'd suggest you do the same, remembering that you're screwing a very finely pitched steel screw, hopefully stainless steel, into an aluminum body. And that should control how tight you get those screws. Alright, that one's in. Two more to go. I'm going to skip over that keyhole slot and I'm going to get the last screw in the focus group next. And I'm going to come back to the helical. back to this keyhole slot. We're going to take the black one out and put the standard mid-length white one in there. And that's the slot that's the screw that is a lot shallower than the slot is deep. So we're going to, oh, okay, now i got a problem here. The shoulder screw came out without the nylon. 
So very gently, I'm going to grab that piece of nylon. I'll put it down in the same orientation because I guarantee that thing's molded with a shoulder in it that I can't see. And I'm going to put the screw right back into it. That thing is so small I can't see the darn thing. While I've got it out here, I was going to go ahead and try and put it in where it belongs, but I'm going to finish what I was doing before I mess up and something gets out of line. Okay. Yeah, like I was saying before, something gets out of line. There we go. All right, that was in and loosely snugly. Now I can start to pull this helicoid back out until it lines up. Now I have to figure out which one of these was the one that has the... I have to re-index myself. There's my index mark right there. My index mark is right here. And I know that this one is the one that has the the larger screw in it. So I'm going to put it in first. That way I can't mess up and put the wrong screw in that hole. And again. I'm going to complain one more time, Nikon. How come I can't take that off there? Where's the disconnect? So now that this screw, remember this, this was the one that's much longer than the rest. It's the one that goes in this slot right here. This helical slot right beside where this contact strip ends. Now some of the blogs and websites I read said that you also need to apply a little bit of lubricant into these helical slots. So at some point before I put all this circuitry back on covering it all up. We're going to need to remember to do that, but I'm not going to do it yet. I still have to get this focus ring back into place. It's a little off-centered. All right, we got two screws left. The last two screws we need to install are the really thin-headed black ones. And they go in these last two open slots here. And these little buggers are so tiny. This may take me a few tries, folks. Hmm. Or maybe not. It's in. One more to go, and we're going to test it. You remember before when we took it apart, it was sticking at 17 millimeters, and there was just no convincing it otherwise unless you pushed and pulled on the lenses, which is kind of difficult out in the field when you're trying to keep them clean. To be yanking on and pushing on them and getting your fingers all over them. And I'm getting all this stuff so tangled up. This is driving me crazy. Where do we go? So. Okay. I can't find it. The last helical actually goes under this contact strip right here. So I'm going to need to twist this around, push it in, twist it. This is the moment of truth. So we need to get that screw to where we can see it. And just like last time, I can't move it. Oh, there it goes. Very stiff. It should not be that stiff. I need to apply a little bit more grease before we walk away from this. Alright, but now you can see I have the last hole lined up down here out from underneath all the ribbon cable. We'll drop the last 
flat, small, black bushing shoulder screw into that one. Oops. All right. In it's a little bit snug. Hmm. All right. Well, I can say that it is working. Right now it's zoomed out to 17, and it is stuck. Son of a gun. I should be able to put my finger on this and push it that way. Right now it's at 17, and this would emulate you grabbing your zoom ring and trying to zoom it towards 35, and it ain't happening. That's a little bit frustrating. If I push on the rear element, I can make it go all right so there may be something wrong with this lens that I just can't figure out maybe bent or something at this point so I guess when I get it back together, I just can't zoom her out to 17. We'll see. I'll put a little bit more grease in there and finish putting her together and we'll just see what's going on. All right, so at this point, I'm going to go around and tighten these screws up. I'm going to turn off the camera, but I'm going to go around and tighten all these screws up. I'm going to brush a little bit of grease in these slots. I'll try it again and start putting the circuitry back on. I'll get back to you in a little bit. All right, I'm back. I haven't had any grand revelations, but I did in the course of investigating this and trying to work the helicoid, I did get the focus ring to snap back into place. And I can't really explain exactly how or why. It just sort of happened while I was working on the helicoid. I cycled it back and forth a bunch of times. It seems to be working a little easier, so at this point, I think I'm going to reassemble the lens to where I can get a better grip with the actual handle for the zoom and, and see how well this is actually working. Um, so I'm not going to film all of that. You, you've got the videos that shows you how you took it apart. So unless something comes up that I feel like you need to know, I'm going to reassemble this, and I'll get back to you when I've got it all back together. Okay, didn't get too far along before. I thought I should mention something. Putting this piece back on, don't know what it's called. It's got a little rod that goes down inside the down inside the housing. This piece right here. It's bent over here and goes down into the housing. Um, remember, we looked at the positioning of this when we disassembled it. I'm going to recenter it in the slot. And I'm going to apply a drop of fingernail polish right here that's going to touch both heads and get fill in this slot right here. It's the same way it was when I disassembled it. But you put the fingernail polish on after you've assembled and tightened the screws, you do not want to get the polish or any kind of thread locking compound down in the threads because on screws this small, you're likely to just twist the head off the next time you go to disassemble it. I also need to not forget to go around and tighten up all these screws before I get too far along. All right, real quick note here. As I'm putting this circuit board assembly back on, I've discovered that I did remember this when I took it apart, but there are two of these screws that are much smaller than the others and one that is a little bit larger. The two smaller screws go right here and on the other end of this bracket, which is for this piece. I don't know what it's called, but behind this, there is another screw on the other end of this bracket. That's where the two smaller screws go. Obviously, you have to put this piece on first. And then one of the screws is a fair bit larger then the other ones has a silver head on it and it goes right here just to the left of the capacitors i think i talked about this when i disassembled it but to the left of the capacitors that's a bigger screw that goes through the bracket from this board and the aluminum backing of this board and i think that's all the notes i need to make at this point i've got all the screws back in but two and of course 
you know the one thing that I talked about quite a bit earlier and I'm going to mention it again right now you absolutely have to get this stripped white wire under this bracket when you tighten it up that's that's I'm sure that's some kind of a ground wire to ground the helicoid so I'll come back to you in a few minutes all right well it's only about 30 seconds later and I found a mistake that I've made the pink and the white wire that goes to the VR the um, manual to automatic focus switch it goes down in here I should have put that wire outboard of the ribbon tape you can see it down in there while this is on but down in there is that ribbon tape that I reconnected right there and as you can see the pink and the white wire are going to ride against the outer edges of the helicoid which doesn't turn but there are some screws in there that move and I'm questioning whether those wires should have been outboard of the ribbon tape to hold them away from the helicoid. So I'm going to look at that a little bit and then I may or may not take this back apart and relocate those wires. Now at this point I have all the screws in the circuit board. I've gone back and checked them again. I have the ground wire here under this bracket. Um, I elected not to disassemble this and relocate the routing of these pink and white wires because I discovered that this, you know, the outer helicoid doesn't move. There's one screw down there that moves in a diagonal, and it's one of the really thin-headed black nylon washer shoulder screws. And I don't think that's going to be an issue, but what I'm going to do to make myself sleep a little bit better at night is I'm going to make sure that these wires are as far out of the way as I can get them, and then I'm going to put a little piece of tape over here somewhere to hold them down to keep them from moving around too much. Um, at this point, I'm going to figure I'll polish all the screw heads, and then I'll start to reassemble. The contactor goes on next. Do not forget, after you fingernail polish all the heads, do not forget to reconnect this. This I can see where this would be a very easy thing to forget as you're going through this, but this, remember there was a screw behind there, so this has to reconnect into this ribbon connector. So I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Okay, I've gone through and put all the fingernail polish on. I thought I might want to make a note. When you're putting the fingernail polish on, don't put a big glob on there and cover the whole head and make it a pain for the next person to get the screwdriver down in the slots of the, the screw head. You can even see here where when this was originally assembled, see the red? It's all on one side and it's just up against the side of the head. You want to get it around the edge of the head, but you don't want to glob it on there and cover the whole thing up. All right, so at this point, I'm going to reconnect the, um, the missing ribbon connector here, which is not too difficult of a task to do, but just you want to slide it back into the slot, which is probably going to be the hardest part for someone like me who's losing their dexterity. You don't want to push very hard on this, but alignment is as valuable as anything else. Once it's lined up, it'll just pop in there on its own. But you want to make sure that the fingers are down, down being away from the slot, and then just ever so gently, you want to make sure you feed it gently. You want to work more to line it up than you want to work to try to push it into the slot. This thing, will, it'll just about go in on its own once you've got it lined up correctly. And it's only going to go in as, as far as the slack will let it go in if some of the contact surface is still exposed. Let's see if we can get this to focus. You can see right there, if some of the contact surface is still exposed, that is, that's fine. As long as you make good contact. But when you run out of slack, you run out of slack. And there's only so much you can do about it. And once you have that in there, you want to push these two fingers back up in an even motion. I discovered on the other ribbon connector that if you try to squeeze this one up, and then squeeze that one up, squeezing this one up just teeter-totters the other one right back out. So you want to grab them with two thumbnails and push them up. And there's no noticeable click, but just wiggle it a little bit with the skin of your finger to make sure it won't open up back up on its own. And next we're going to... Yep. 
Actually, I'm going to put the usual suspect back on next. Because I don't think I need to put that connector back on there quite yet. Oh no, I can't. Because this connects to the zoom ring, which we haven't assembled the zoom ring yet. So, I guess I do need to do this in the order that I said I did originally. So we're going to come back around here and reassemble the bayonet connector ribbon cable. Again, I'm just making up words. I don't know if these are the right names for these things. Since Nikon is so secretive, we just make it up as we go. Again, the same approach here with the ribbon connector. Put it in as far as it'll allow you without forcing it. And then you want to push the ears in evenly. Check it with the skin of your finger to see if it'll unhook. And then route this ribbon cable back into place, just like so. You see the ribbon cable. There's a slot here in the helicoid to give room for the ribbon cable. You want to tuck it in under the circuit board and come up through the slot. And then next is going to be the outer housing, which I'll need to find my index mark. Remember the index mark I made with a Sharpie? Right in there. So I'm going to put that back at my 6 o'clock. Let me just for now. And remember the index mark I was using before I took the housing off. So I put that at 6 o'clock. And then we're going to need to get this over here. I'm doing my best here to film this in a way y'all can use it, but you'll have to excuse me. I'm not... It's my first YouTube video, so I'm trying to have a little patience with me. So now the pink and white wire I want to make sure is routed in such a way that not... We don't want there to be any damage wind up to this wire because of some way that we routed it. And right now I suppose it's in as good a spot as it's going to get into. And then it, it naturally... I don't remember exactly which way that switch was lined up, but given the nat the way it just naturally lays there, if I try to lay this down, and after however many years, you can tell that this, this piece laid right about like that. So I'm going to imagine that when I put this housing on here, indexing my marks, it needs to go like this. At this point, I'm kind of wondering where this, which screws were used to hold this in. Okay. I'm going to say it was these two. If it's not, I, they're easy to get to and get them back out and replace them if I have to. Oh, and one thing I'll mention here that when I was reassembling that circuit board, these are the uh, chamfered edge countersunk screws that look like they should be the ones to go in here, but they sure aren't acting like it. Now, I'm not putting any torque on this. I'm just, if it's not going to go in under its own accord, I'm not going to force it. Take this back out and see if we can. Maybe it's not lined up right. Let's try the same screw in the other hole. It feels like it's too small. Here, let's do a little investigation. Here we 
darn careful with these screws you drop on them you'll never see it again all right it does thread into that hole must be an alignment issue that i'm having or a length issue maybe those aren't the right screws after all They're the only ones I see around here that match what I think they should look like. That's not it. These just look too darn long. I've used all my screws right to left. All right, gonna do a little research, go back and look at my own videos, get back with you after dinner. All right, so you can see how far ahead I am here, but I'm gonna take part of this back apart to show you how I got one of these pieces in here. You'll notice that there's some dental floss hanging out here. And that is the secret. And I tried it a few times. You cannot feed this piece down through from the top. Just trust me, it just can't be done. Remember this piece we were originally calling the original suspect? It's a bugger. This piece. Okay. To get this piece in, it will not fit down through here once you have the zoom cover on there, the zoom ring cover. So what you have to do is drop this down in here over the controlling screw. Remember the one screw that sticks out that rides in this, this slot right here? Put it in there, put it over that screw, and it's just going to dangle down in there. You can't get it to stay in place. You take the other two ends of your dental floss, feed them up through the zoom housing, zoom ring housing, whatever this, the outer housing, upper housing, I don't know, the housing with all the writing on it. And then the bottom half of this housing, you need to, you need to index it with your index mark. And slowly get it into place. Now keep in mind that this piece is just dangling down in there. You only need to worry about indexing the bottom half right now. And of course I'm not going to be able to do it. I did this so easy when I had the camera off. It's just a matter of gently wiggling it around until you get it to drop all the way down into place. Which right there it's a pretty tight gap right down here when it's all the way in place now once it's in place you have a handle on our usual suspect prime suspect whatever you want to call it and you can pull it up making sure that the the, the boss that sticks out from the helicoid is inside that groove and then you rotate the zoom ring underneath of it and by doing that you can get it pretty close to where the two screw holes are there See if I can get this on camera. See this? You start off with it like this, and you pull this up with the dental floss, and then you rotate that boss under it. And once you have it there, it won't fall down in. So now you can hold this in place with a screwdriver, and pull your dental floss out. And at that point, keeping it held in place with the tip of your screwdriver, then you can get your screws lined up now the one part that I started to talk about a little while ago and I just got distracted by something that was happening is some of the screws I had to put back into the circuit board there was just no way to feed them down in vertically downward and keep them on the tip of the screwdriver. Maybe if you had a magnetic screwdriver, you might be able to do that. But I don't have one, and I'm not sure how great of an idea that is anyway. So what I did was I got the screw on the tip of the screwdriver just like this and then held the lens up over top of it and fed it vertically, vertically up 
with the lens up here and feed the screw up into the hole to get it started. So there's one little tip for you. And of course I think we all know the big risk right here right now is this thing is completely assembled and if you lose this screw it's going down inside and you wind up having to take the whole thing apart again to find it especially if it goes inside the helicoid. So I'm taking the risk by just hooking it with my fingernail but you may want to be a little bit more prudent. I don't know exactly how you could do the same thing. You could flip the lens over and feed that screw vertically upward. Once those two screws are in. Now these two screws originally did not have any varnish on them, any thread locker, fingernail polish, nothing. So I'm going to put it back the same way. You're going to have to use your own judgment there. So at this point, I should be able to test out the zoom. Oh, maybe not. Nope, not yet. Alright, I still have some other pieces I'm going to need to assemble here. I have the two shoulder screws that were over here. I don't know how well this is getting lit up, but over over here, right, just a little bit that way of the ribbon cable, there's the two shoulder screws that are the stops for the zoom ring. So they're going to need to go in next. Can't quite pick this thing up and start to crank on it yet. Oh, straight slotted screws. What genius decided that was a good idea. So to try to fit a straight slotted screw down in, way down in this slot and get it vertically lined up in that hole and started where you can't hook it with your fingernail or anything, I'm going to venture a guess that, that might just be impossible. So what I'm going to do is a redneck trick. See there? Look at that. It holds it right on the end of the screwdriver. be just enough to get it started very gently. It's not going to take a lot of sideways force to undo this. I know just a minute ago I was preaching about I wasn't sure how good of an idea it was to magnetize anything in here, but I think we're far enough removed from the electronics and the guts of this device that we can safely take that risk. There's one. Here's number two. As much as I'm just itching to pick this thing up and grab that zoom ring and give her a whirl, it's just not quite ready yet. Okay. Now we had these brass shims in here for the next pieces. And believe me, folks, I would not recommend shorting yourself one of these things because I can tell just from handling them. I know there's no way this is going to come across on the focus. You can see these are all of very different thicknesses and I'm sure they were somehow it was somehow determined how thick these needed to be for each individual lens this, this is not a spec piece that they just grab out of a bin and put it in there now to line these up this screw right here this screw right where my thumb is that screw needs to go into well, focus for me, camera. There's a slot right here from the inside diameter. Right there. That's the slot that needs to go over that screw. And when you're looking at yours and doing this, you'll easily see that is the only way those pieces are going to go together. 
there's no other way for it to fit. Now, this is going to be just amazingly fun. I may have to turn the camera off here and take a break before I even try this. Re-index my lens, and I know that the aperture control inside a helicoid is right in this area. And as you remember, there were two fingers that stuck up there. They're kind of like this. One finger was longer than the other, and this this bar on the bottom of the aperture control here needs to hit that longer finger and push it over until you can slide it down in between there. So that bar on that aperture ring needs to come over and hit the top taller finger, push it over enough until you can slide it down in. That's the only way the aperture is going to work again when you go to put this together. So I'm going to try this very gently once or twice and then I may just take a break and come back to it later. Just trust me, the one thing you do not want to do here is work on something like this when you're frustrated with it. Been there, done that in my youth. Remember the time I yanked the distributor out of the 1968 Thunderbird and threw it over the house into the backyard. It was funny at the time. But I've learned better ways since those days. Alright, All right, what I'm going to do folks is I'm going to turn off the camera and experiment with this a little bit. And I'm sure there's going to be a way that we can index this because these holes in the brass shim are very unevenly spaced. So if we look at the holes here, we will very easily be able to figure out. I've got it indexed pretty well. I think you're going to need to be able to drop this down in. There's a slot here that... There's a slot right there. and Let's see if it'll come out on the camera. Let's get the light right here in a different position. Nope, that's not going to work. It's off camera, dumbass. Alright, so right here... That slot you can see the end of right there. Right here. The end of that slot is right about where the aperture control is. So I suspect that maybe they were smart enough to make this to where this rod needs to go right over against that slot and then down and then back over to snatch that taller tang on that aperture control. But I'm gonna give it a few shots off camera and catch up with you later. Okay, well, it worked. What I, what I was saying about rotating it this way, dropping it down, you had to pull it back a little bit and just keep jiggling it up and down until you caught that one taller finger. And, you know, the one finger will go back that way on its own. When you grab just that one taller finger and you rotate it and slide it down, it worked. It took me a few tries. I mean, don't get frustrated with it. You know, if you get frustrated, walk away and come back. Um, but it did work. The aperture opens and closes. Now you can drop the bezel, or the, uh, ah, can't remember the name of this thing. Bayonet mount. Bayonet mount goes in next. It seems like this piece should go in next, but it doesn't. It goes in from the top. Difficult to hear. And which I suspect is the reason why you can put the screws in the connector first, and then you can drop this piece down in so that the, screw, the, the electronics connector will be held into place. Um, now remember, one of these bayonet screws was much shorter than the others, and it's this one. The one at 12 o'clock from your index mark is the one that's shorter. It only threads into the aperture ring, so I'm going to drop that one in first. I'm just going to barely get it started. And that way we'll keep, the, we'll keep the bayonet mount and the aperture ring lined up with each other because we still have to line up the aperture ring with the holes in that, those brass shims. And then the holes in the top of the helicoid below that, which may be a bit of a challenge because you can't actually rotate all that stuff now. It's all fit into slots. So what you want to do is just keep trying, keep wiggling the whole thing around, and eventually you get one to bite, just like that. Don't tighten any of these up. Get them all started before you tighten any of them up. Leave them loose. Granddaddy taught me that. My dad taught me that. My cousin taught me that. I had to learn the hard way. I was stubborn. So at this point, now when you got all of these started, and you can give them one last little crank, 
tighten them up. These did not have any fingernail polish or varnish on them either. I'm sure there's a torque spec somewhere in inch millimeters or some weird ass number you can't buy a torque wrench for. Now, out of these screws, I'm going to dump these out of this lens cap into another a little bit more manageable dish. If you remember, there's two of them that have quite a bit smaller heads on them. Those are the ones that go in the electronic connector. So there's five screws. I really doubt you can see. But if you remember from when you took it apart, there are two of these that are countersunk. Those are the ones that go in the electronic connector. We're going to put those in first, loosely. Then we're going to put this piece in. Then we'll put the other three in. So, as small as these are, I think I probably should have done this when I was younger. Let me switch back to uh, right back to the triple alt bit. It looks too big, but it's the right one, folks. Still enough. Of, enough magnetism in it just barely to pick one up. Alright, I got one on there. Hold it in place with my finger. This will be the difficult part. finding the hole in the plastic of the electronic connector and it's just going to be a little bit of trial and error. Like I was saying before, don't force it. This is not the time to be forcing anything. And there it is. Slowly twist around with that thing and then realign it a little bit at a time until it pops into place. Now remember here, you're threading a metal screw into a piece of plastic and that metal screw is about, the diameter of that screw is about the thickness of my thumbnail. So these aren't going to take a whole lot of torque to hold them in place. It's the kind of thing you want to, every so often on a rainy day, you got a little extra time. It's probably the kind of thing you want to get all your lenses out and just take a good look at them. Gently put a screwdriver on them to test them. I'm going to re-index the lens. I'm going to go ahead and put this piece back into place. I should probably test the zoom at this point before I get too far down the road. But i uh, tell you the truth, at this point I'm not going to take it back apart anyway. If I haven't fixed it by now, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to ship it off to... Um, Oh, there's a place in Durham that has excellent reviews. The guy's name is Sebastian. And because I'm recording this on my phone, I can't look it up. So I will look that up before I finish this video. Haven't used him, but I can tell you he has excellent reviews. He is not, he does not come up on Nikon search for authorized repair centers. I don't know why. To tell you the truth, Nikon, I think, is being a little bit more protective and proprietary than they are worried about their customers in a lot of these instances. They just won't give out enough information because I've just proved that someone who's not trained can take these apart and put them back together. And if they give us a little bit more information, but they're not worried about taking care of their customers, they're worried about their bottom line. And I get it, they're worried about protecting their brand, you know. Heaven forbid I take this thing apart and screw it up and sell it to somebody else and they buy it. They think, oh, Nikon's all junk. So I get that end of it, but we don't all need to be coddled by these manufacturers into thinking that we can't do it. We need help. I need help. All right, so I'm even going to go so far as to put the rubber rings back on. Of course, I'm dumb enough to put them back on in the wrong place from the looks of it. Huh? That was the right place. Sure didn't look wide enough to fill that gap up. Oh, there's another, there's another uh, edge there I didn't get it down to. And I'm going to have to come up with some contact cement somewhere along the way to reattach these. It just takes a little dab. You can see how much right there. That's all it takes is that, that much contact cement in two places, 180 degrees apart. You don't have to glue that thing on there. Like it's a felt lining in your grandma's jewelry box. But for now, they'll work loose. Alright, I got her all back together. And the zoom is working. Look at there. 
actually working a lot better than it was when I took it apart. Not perfect. Far from perfect. But it's working. This thing was froze up solid. It wasn't going to work before. And you can see the, the front element on these lenses moves as well. It kind of does a hippity hop up and down, which I don't understand, but I'm not a lens engineer. Uh, hold on a second, I'm going to grab my camera and we'll hook it up and see. I have to apologize, folks. I just realized at this point that I've left my air conditioner on again. Probably made it hard for y'all to hear what I was saying. All right, 810. 810 works just fine with the 18 to 140 on it. We're going to drop this one in here. Mounts fine. E E O. I don't have the. There we go. I didn't have the aperture locked at f22. If you ever see that f e e error, which took me a while to figure it out when I started, but watch. As soon as I turn this off at f22, try to get some information here. F e e. Crank that aperture ring back around f22. Boom! It works. All right. So at this point, I'll put her in live view. I don't know how much you can actually see here in live view. And I'm going to make sure that we are in automatic focus. We got her in autofocus here. We got an autofocus here. And I use the back button focus. Now you can hear it squeaking. Now it was squeaking before I took it apart. Now I never did get down into the motor and the focus mechanisms, remember. Not something I'd have the parts to fix anyway. But it does work. You can see there, it's working. So, success. Before I let you go, I'm going to grab my tablet. And I'm going to look up the name of that, um, that fella in Durham, North Carolina. That even though I may not have to use him, I still would strongly recommend the guy. Just based on his reviews again, I haven't used him. And yeah, I know I probably shouldn't be sitting here saying, um, while I'm talking to you. Camera works. Uh, he's on Carver Street in Durham, North Carolina. I asked for a guy named Sebastian. I had done my research, and that's where this was going. If I wasn't able to get it fixed. And for all I know, the thing will break again next week. And um, I wind up having to send it there anyway. But let's take a picture with it while I got you here. We're going to focus. We're going to snap a picture, and we're going to play, and we're going to zoom all the way in. You can see there, and hopefully that's focusing. That's a pretty good shot. Uh, if you want to go all the way out in the corner, I know these cameras have a reputation for being a little soft, and yeah, you can see it there. I'm not even down in the corner yet, but it's also a pretty close shot. I mean, that shot was maybe 18 inches away. That's right at the limit of what this thing will do. 1.25 feet. So it's right at the narrow end of its capacity. So anyway, thanks for watching. I know that this was long and a little bit wordy at times and a little bit just exploratory, but take it from me. You can do this if you have any mechanical inclination at all. Don't be scared. Talk to you later.